So hello everyone, welcome to West Talks. Uh, um, as always, we'll start with a brief introduction on IC Impacts and UVC Future Waters. So IC, I mean, they, these webinars are hosted jointly by IC Impacts and UBC Future Waters, and India-Canada Network of Settlers of Excellence, as well as UBC's water cluster. So moving forward, I mean, uh, just, just to give a brief overview of the organizers, it's Abhishek, uh, Jaskaran, myself, uh, Karl, and Feria. Um, so jointly hosted by students from UBC Chemical Engineering, UBC Environmental Engineering, and McGill University, and also Feria from IC Impacts. So this week's talk, this is our actually our 12th talk. So we have been pretty successful in getting these going uh, with a good number of attendants. So this week we have Dr. Basu from Kartim uh, going to talk about her work in Tanzania. Uh, and as you can see, we have a lot of upcoming talks. The next week's talk is, uh, is going to be focused on DBPs. Uh, after that, we'll have a talk from Barbara Evans on uh, WASH and we'll be continuing forward. So keep in touch or just keep looking at the website, following it to get more updates. And we'll also be sending updates to all the people who have registered in our mailing list. Now, just as a change, uh, oh, sorry, uh, just to let you know that all our webinars are getting updated on the YouTube page. So if you have missed any session or if you want to get back to any session, uh, please feel free to go to IC Impacts' uh, YouTube web page and then you can see all our talks. Just as a change uh, for this week, I have tried to add colors as Dr. Basu did in her cover picture. <laughs> so, Today is International Coffee Day. So if you haven't had your coffee yet, uh, you can celebrate it today. It's also World Vegetarian Day. So <laughs> for all the vegetarian people here, I mean, also non-vegetarian people too, but today is World Vegetarian Day. And tomorrow is International Day of Nonviolence. So it's the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, I can proudly announce that IC Impacts partnered with the Council Journal of India. Um, Yes, uh, last, last night to give a webinar on the relevance of Mahatma Gandhi's teachings on uh, in today's society. And our CEO, Dr. Nemi Bantia, gave a talk in it. So if you're interested, we'll be posting that uh, Facebook link in the chat box. So if you want to go to it and have a look, in, please feel to do it. It's a wonderful session. So uh, getting to today's talk, uh, we have Dr. Onita Basu from Carlton. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, she specializes in process optimization of sustainable technologies with a particular focus on water treatment. Uh, <clears throat> her expertise is, uh, I mean, her work is broadly in the area of filtration, uh, biofiltration and um, membrane processes too, and as well as organics, uh, organic sorting as well as some energy as well. I think uh, Dr. Basu has started some work in the field of energy too. So her work, but particularly her work in the field of water treatment and uh, encompasses many aspects of uh, point of use and home use pot filters uh, to industrial scale biofilters and membrane technology. So uh, really looking forward to her talk today. And also Dr. Basu is a uh, recipient of two 2019 Carlton Research Achievement Awards and 2020 Ottawa Chapter Professional Engineering Civics Award. So I'll pass it on to Dr. Basu and look forward to her wonderful talk. Thanks, thanks, Puhar. That's a really generous introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen in a second. Yeah, just as soon as you finish us with your share. There we go. Let's see. There we go, perfect, excellent. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull up my, uh, my PowerPoint as everyone's now familiar with Zoom and start my talk for today. So, slideshow, there we go. Okay, so uh, thanks so much to everyone at West Talks for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to everyone who's taken time out of their day to listen to my talk on point of use water treatment um, and a case study in Longido, Tanzania. The picture on this on my uh, opening page is me uh, and Robbie, my PhD student with the with the literacy group that we are working with in in uh, in Tanzania. So for my talk, 
I'm just going to start off with a location profile uh, and a little bit of background information. Uh, so Tanzania is located on the um, on the east side of Africa, so you can see it here. And within that, we're working specifically in the district of Longido, which is just at the border with uh, Kenya up here in the corner. And it's just a, a four-hour drive from Mount Kilimanjaro. As many people are familiar with Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, in terms of what the population is like in Longido, it's around 125,000 people. It's a very rural district. It's semi-arid, so it's dry most of the year and people do not have access to water on a regular uh, basis. At least they don't have tap water in their homes like we would have here. So way back in 2014, I was invited by some people that work at a local NGO called uh, Tembo and another professor at Carleton to see if I would be interested in working through Tembo on grassroots water issues. So it was very broad at the time and we didn't exactly know where we were gonna go with the project. Um, I was very happy to be engaged in the project. And so that's kind of where it started off. And I, I wanted to pull up this timeline from 2014 all the way to 2020, because the first thing I really want to get across is that this is not about doing something quickly. We are working in a, a rural marginalized area, area, um, area and, I, and I really believe that in order to make a good vested investment in many ways, it's all about a slow research approach. It's about, in, in Swahili, you would say pole pole, which means slowly, slowly. And so it's about us learning about the community, the community having an opportunity to learn about us and going through a lot of feedback to make sure we're coming to a good project that we're all interested in working on. So in terms of the timeline, we actually started off with undergraduate students that were in fourth year for the most part coming on these uh, site visits with us to do some ideation and some piloting. But I quickly realized that within like by 2016, I realized that in order to, to make some effective change and facilitate that change within the community, I was going to have to move into graduate research. And I was lucky at that time to meet up with Robbie Venus, who became my PhD student and has been working in the community since 2017. So part of the project, again, I kind of, just so we know, it's like, it's all about this cycle of trust building and community engagement. We're working with a traditional Maasai community. Uh, they're very proud of their, of their roots. They don't know me. Um, they don't know what I'm trying to get from them. And so I, we really wanted to walk slowly into the process to work with different activities, get to know the people in the community, get that feedback and just keep this loop going until we narrowed it down. So we started with this project ideation. So we generated a lot of ideas. We did some initial pilots, got some feedback on the pilots, and then we moved into our full scale point of view study. So I really wanted to talk about for the, the whole uh, presentation today, like the whole process that we went through because I wanna emphasize the need for, for slow change to make effective change. So we started off with this ideation and pilots and what does that look like? So, you know, at home and Carleton, the students actually generated a lot of really, oops, sorry, go back. Hold on, there we go. Generated a lot of really good ideas. So we looked at local water storage with tarps on a BOMA. We looked at bottle brick tanks. We looked at a solar dehumidifier as an option. We took these ideas and we talked to the community about them and others. And then we also went on to actual physical piloting within the community. So here on the lower left-hand side, we, the students built a fog net and we saw if that was gonna work out. We did local material assessments as well because we wanted to make sure that any project that we're vested in can be supplied through a local means and doesn't require us to bring in international parts into it so that it's more sustainable. And then of course, over on the lower uh, right hand side here, we see some water quality testing. It's a water project. We needed to test some of the water to make sure some of the treatments would work. So this is what you can see here. You'll actually notice how dirty the water is in the, in the lower side there. So that particular pilot didn't totally work out. Okay. 
So as part of it, you know, we did uh, several site visits. I've been there nine or 10 times since 2015. I've lost count, I guess, at this point. And you need to do the site visit because we, we need to meet the people in the community, of course, and the community needs to meet us. We need to increase our local understanding of the, of the culture and the ethos of, of how things work within that area. So just quickly through the top here, we can see this is the traditional BOMA uh, on the upper left-hand side. We did activities where we were building a tippy tap, which is like a hand washing station at a local school. These are two of the undergrad students that were working on this one. We also engaged several times on local water walks with the women. And this was to in increase our own personal understanding of their, of their situation and the challenges of walking every day to get water or every other day to get water. I learned that I have a really weak, well, I, I learned that I'm just really weak in general. I have a really weak neck specifically. You can see everyone trying to carry the water, like using their foreheads to help carry. It's really, water is really heavy. Um, and then the last one in the lower uh, right hand corner is we also did a lot of engagement activities. So here we, this is in Kimakoa, we visited with the village leaders and the, the point of visiting with the village leaders was to get their take on their information. What are, what's their view on what water issues are and what are some of the strategies that they would like us to consider and what they're considering and again and how we can work together. So this is a water project. And of course we have to know what are the different water sources that we're working with. So this is a pretty good snapshot of the basic kinds of water that are, that are available in the community. So here, oops, oh, I'm going to figure out my mouse, there we go. <laughs> so in the upper left hand side, this is a, a man-made um, earthen basin, a very large one built out in the rural parts of, Longi of the district of Longido meant to catch rainwater uh, during a heavy rain season. They have two rain, sort of two heavy rainfalls a year. So it's a good time to catch it. This water though, importantly, is used by the family members for their drinking water source, their washing source, and is also used by the cattle for drinking. So it's used by everyone and every animal in the household. And it's, it's not particularly safe to consume. Another one on the upper right hand side is during the dry season, this is actually a dry riverbed, the women will go down to the dry riverbeds, dig down until they get to that groundwater level and then collect the water from there and fill it into these little yellow pots. On the lower left hand side, there's quite a few taps in the district of Longuito as well. So there's lots of ways you can get water. So you have assigned water days and on your assigned water days, you collect the water from the tap. And there's two different sources of where that tapped water can come from. One is shown here on the lower right hand side. This is uh, Mount Longuito and there's a, a local sort of small dam that's been built and it drains into one of these taps, but it's untreated. And then another one comes from uh, Mount, it's called the Simba Line. It actually comes from Kilimanjaro. And that one's really recent. It was only um, built since about 2018, maybe, I think. Okay, so the other part that we have to look at, so now we've, we've been going and we've been visiting with people and we have an understanding of the different kinds of water sources, but we actually had no information on anything about water. Like we didn't know if people were treating their water, if they're not treating their water, how much can you store? And we need all this information to try and come up with our water project that we're going to be working in the community with. So we spent um, some time uh, doing a survey with two of the local, they're called sub villages. So it's the district of Longuito and there's a bunch of sub villages in it. So we collected data from two of the sub villages. One is Kimakoa and the other one is Otapese. And what we learned was the following. If you look on the left hand side, this is Kimakoa. And on the Y axis, there's the number of households and on the X axis is where you could get your water from. So if you look here, um, the mo most of the people in Kimakoa actually fetch their water from a local water hole. So similar to getting water from like the dry riverbed situation. And then a smaller proportion do have access to a village tap 
and that's where they would get their primary source of water. And there's a few people who actually have a household tap that comes to their house, but it would not be treated. And then in Old Tepese, most of the community has access to the village tap and then a smaller portion onto, the, uh, onto a well system. So the next question we are interested in is how much water can you store? Because of course, the amount of water you can store or have access to on any given day impacts how much you actually have to get water. You know, here in Canada, I just go to my tap and I open it whenever I want to get my water. But that's not the same in Longido. You're either walking to a village tap or you're walking to a well or you're walking to a water hole. So how much you can store impacts how frequently you have to do that. So it was another project that we've looked at and as well in terms of um, engaging with the community. So here's Kimakoa again on the left hand side with our households. And the main point between for both Old Tepese and Kimakoa is that most of the families store less 20 liters or less of water per day which translates to meaning that they have to get water on a very frequent basis, so daily or maybe every other day, which is a huge burden on women and girls in particular, because the implication, not just the implication, the reality is they're spending all of their time getting water and none of their time doing anything else. And for girls, this also translates into missing school and missing the opportunity to get an education. So the last question that we were interested in for this uh, survey that we did was, do you treat your water? And so again, we've got Kimakoa on the left and we've got households on the y-axis. And so just simply put, you can see that in Kimakoa, you know, about 40% of the people treated their water in some way and the majority did not. And in Old Tepese, everyone said that they didn't treat their water. So when we followed up with those who said they treated water, we asked what they meant by how do you treat your water? And so the majority answer was a cloth filter. And so, you know, just to be clear, it's like taking a piece of material. Material that you would wear water, but it's not an effective treatment method. And then a smaller portion of people are also boiling their water. So that's good to know that some people do boil their water. And again, in Ulta Pese, the feedback was that they weren't actually treating their water at all, which may or may not be true. It may just be an indication of their level of understanding of what treating your water means. So there's like a, a loop in there, which informs us on the, on the need for education and the association of water treatment and water safety, and then health. So with all of that, we did the site visits, we did the piloting, we had lots of meetings. So the goal of this was to do these loops of community engagement, you know, knowledge attainment and feedback sessions with the local community to narrow down to a project that was going to be sustainable and of interest and had buy-in, which I think is so important. You have to have buy-in and interest from the local community because if they're not interested in it, then you're, not, you're just not gonna do it. So we did this um, and then that's how we got to, finally, our point of use water treatment system. And what we focused in on was these ceramic filters. So why did we pick the ceramic filters? Because people were interested in water treatment. The ceramic filters are made locally, which lets us uh, know that it's going to be a sustainable solution. And beyond just the sustainable solution, it supports the local economy. And within the concept of working with point of use filters, we have two envelopes here on, on the social side that we're working within. One is both the provision of point of use filters to local schools, and then associated with that is education in the schools on water sanitation hygiene. And then the other one is to work with women and women's groups on access to point of use water filters um, and what that means for them and, and just to see if they're gonna use them. I'm gonna come to that again in a second. So first of all, let me just describe a little bit about like, so what exactly is 
a ceramic filter? What is this point of use device that I've talked about? So again, on the left-hand side with this picture, we see, you know, essentially a dirty glass of water. You can put it through the filter and it comes out cleaner. Not totally clean, but cleaner. So the way a ceramic filter is made is just imagine a garden pot. So you've got a garden pot, but in this case, you mix that clay pot before you fired it with sawdust or some sort of other firing material like rice husks. And then when you put it in the kiln, those sawdust material or rice husks, they burn away, leaving a porous network. And that porous network within the framework of the pot allows that passage of water through it and retains a large portion of the dirt and the bacteria that would others co otherwise come through into the water. Okay, so this is great. We've like, we've done lots of meetings. We've, we've figured out where we're gonna go. We like, we like the one that we've chosen because it's going to be sustainable in the sense that it's locally made, but that doesn't mean there's not challenges within our decision. So there's both social challenges and technical challenges within the project. So the first thing uh, to recognize is that the presence of technology does not mean that people are going to use it. Just because you provide technology to someone doesn't mean they're going to inherently be like, oh, wow, this is amazing and I'm just going to do it because someone told me to use it. So there's lots of research that shows that um, there's a high amount of failure associated with these kinds of projects. So in particular with point of use water treatment systems, there's a couple studies that have shown upwards of you know 90% failure after six months. So we don't want to have 90% of our participants dropping out after six months. So we need to kind of address those challenges within the way we implement our program. Um, there's a general lack of exposure to water, sanitation, and hygiene information within the community. So if you don't know about water, sanitation, and hygiene, why would you even care about the filter in the first place? And then the, the last point is there's not a lot of actual long-term studies on community-led educational planning and their associated uptake with filters or with any kind of a point of use device. So the, we're trying to say is if we provide long-term training from a community-led perspective, will we have more successful outcomes? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know yet. And then, then there's the technical challenges. So there's social challenges and there's technical challenges. First, the cost of the filter is way too expensive. This is the local cost. This is way outside of the affordability envelope. The flow rate is low. The flow rate is only one to four liters per hour. So people get impatient. They don't wanna wait an hour to get a liter of water. So even if you have the device, if the output is too low, people stop using it. And then the last point is there's, there's a fair amount of breakage in the field um, also because they are not, they're a little bit fragile at times. So <laughs> amazingly, Robbie is working on all of these issues. I don't have time to go through the technical issues today, uh, but I just want to highlight that Robbie is actually working on the technical issues with our industrial partner on the ground. And so I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to that part of it with both a picture of what it's like at the factory here. And then here's Robbie uh, working with uh, John at the factory on some of the technical issues where we actually, he works like on site and then in the lab at Carleton uh, to help with that part of the project. He could do a whole presentation just on that. So coming back to the social sciences side of the project and our point of use case study, we're working right now with two groups. One is a literacy group and one is a hospital prenatal group. The goal of um, these projects is to essentially uh, provide education and wash training to the women and follow up weekly and then follow up on three months for how their outcomes are. All of the women are provided filters for use in their, in their homes as part of the study. So really what we wanna look for is the association of education and engagement with filter outcomes, specifically long-term health 
and filter adoption. And one of the important parts of this study is it's designed in three month increments. So our first phase is to do three months with training and see what the outcomes are and then to pause the program for three months and then do more interviews and see what's happened. If the outcomes are good, then, then that's successful. And then we'll do one at nine months. But if the outcomes aren't good, that means we have to relook at the loop that we thought was okay and do it a little bit differently, which is gonna, I think, bring me to, oh, almost my next slide. I, I'm a little, I think I'm okay for time. So before I show you the results, our first six months results, what I wanna show you is, what I wanna to explain to you is the amount of people involved in this study. This, this isn't just us, right? So we're Carleton, we're working in this literacy group, but in order for this whole program to work, so many people had to come together. We have two local water, water, water facilitators who are actually doing the educational training and doing the interviews for us. We've trained them, Robbie's trained them primarily. We've trained them on what to do and we've observed them and we've given them feedback, but it's their job to do the training. And one of the reasons they're doing the training is that the Maasai primarily speak Ma, even though the official language in Tanzania is Swahili. So we speak English. Robbie actually learned Swahili and can speak Swahili now, but there's English, Swahili, and Ma. So we really needed people who could speak Ma to work within our, literary, our literacy group. The literacy group was not created by us. It was created by the NGO that we're working with. And they, because they've invested into the project and they believe in the project, have brought us into their literacy group as a portion of the time for it. Even before we could do that, we actually had to get permission from the male village leaders to say it was okay to interface with these groups to start with. And then on the other side, we needed our ceramic manufacturer locally to be interested in the project. And then we have Wine to Water, which is a US-based NGO, which is facilitating our project by um, actually providing filters at half price for us so that we can provide it to more women and who've also helped us develop an app. So our facilitators have a phone app where they can record all the data and then when they're done with their meetings, they can upload it online for Robbie to get. It's so amazing. There we go. So much information. Let's see. Okay. So I'll just go through this part quickly. So our baseline interview, the main, the main point that I wanted to get from the baseline interviews uh, to share with you is that about 40% of the participants said they had diarrhea more than once per month. And you know, 60% are about less than once per month. And importantly, 60% of children are sick from diarrhea regularly, so once per month or more. And there's a big association with diarrhea and malnutrition. So if you can't keep the nutrients in your body, then you don't grow as well as, uh, as, well as we would like. And then another important point is just the finances of the community. So the average monthly amount is around 34 Canadian dollars. And if you remember, we said earlier that the point of use device was 40 US dollars, so 50 Canadian. So there's a huge cost uh, implication of trying to bring the filters into the community. Okay, so let me just skip to um, the outcomes that we have. So some of the numbers are a little bit different than the other slide because it's a, a different data set a little bit. But the main point is at baseline, we have 40% of people who have diarrhea regularly and 60% who are less than once per month. At three months, we're feeling really good. At three months, we have you know 10%, 15% that suddenly have diarrhea um, only at once per month or less, and we have 90% that are less than once per month. But at six months, when we'd had that three month gap, there's two things to notice. We had a large dropout rate in our participants. We went from 49 to 31. So about 60% are still in the study. Not as bad as the 90% dropout, but still we had a 40% dropout. 
and our results are really close to our baseline results again. So here, you know, we've gone from 40% uh, who had diarrhea regularly, and now at six months, it's around 35%. So that just tells us that we really need to do the educational planning for longer to engage people for longer. We would have liked it if it was good at three months, but it's, it's not. So that's just, that's, that's our feedback loop for ourselves. And again, that's our investment into the project to commit a time and go slowly and do lots of checks so that you can make those corrections. Now just, I'm just gonna skip that one for the, for the time to make sure there's enough time for people to ask questions. So moving forward, what we've done with our six month results is we've, we've, we've paused and we're resetting the program. So now we have a, our literacy group and we're doing it for six months of training and then we'll pause and check at nine months. And we've also started a second, lit a second literacy group where we'll do six months of training, pause and check at nine months and just see how everything is going at that point. Now, I really, I, this project is not possible without my grad student, Robbie Venus, shown here in this picture. So we thought it would be fun to loop him in and I'm gonna connect him into the system in a second. And he is going to share his experience on the project um, with a little bit of academic poetry, which I hope everyone really enjoys. So just bear with me while I connect him. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to read you a poem that I wrote actually while I was working in the field at Aboma doing an interview with our water champions. And so it's called Slow Down. She turned to me and said, Robbie, hey, slow down. At first, I was unsure what she meant as I was trying to tell these Maasai women and men how I wanted to bring clean water to their homes. But what she was saying is that no one makes change alone. First, the white male settler born as me working in this rural Tanzanian community. I have to be aware of how my bias shapes the way I see, be reflexive in my actions to reflect my positionality. Because I represent a history of theft, belittlement, and hate. A history that all my helping will still never escape. And it's a history of telling local people what they know isn't relevant to the development of an economy for growth. And it's a history that's left a scar with great inequality of power, one which still today has left whole nations feeling sour, which is why before I act, I try to stop, to take a pause, remind myself no challenge has only one cause and that maybe there's a way that I can do this next task better. So everybody feels like we took that step together because all the knowledge that I've gained through the books and the lectures that I've seen is only one small part of bringing water that's clean to a community of people who live lives unlike my own. People who know things unlike anything I've known. Like how to use wood, mud, or cow dung to make the walls upon their homes, or how to follow wind to find the grass for cows to grow. And so it doesn't matter that I know how water filters treat disease or that I can explain disinfection mechanisms with ease. It doesn't matter that I know words like coagulation or bacteriostasis, because I'll never know the life that turns these spaces into places. So though my job while in the lab is to make these filters cheap, to change the materials to less costly ones so it's a product all can see. In the field, I'm there to learn from them, to absorb the wisdom that they give. So this intervention fits within the lives they already live. But that does not mean it's easy or that I even know what to do. In fact, it makes it harder to work any challenge through because life there can just be hard, often in ways difficult for me to believe. And the temptation is to give and hope that people just receive with appreciation and smiling faces and then lead a better life. But nothing is so simple in a systematic struggle because history, politics, geography play a role. Poverty is more than just its economic toll. It's about agency and power. It's seldom talked about as such. We're so focused on money and folks not having very much, but poverty is a lever used in our system to oppress, 
to marginalize and disenfranchise certain people from the rest. Which is why within my work, it's local women in the lead. It's driven by the people because they know what they need. I'm just there to help organize, sometimes teach filter science too. So when I'm gone, the project can go on sustainable through and through. So within this talk, we've been trying to say how to wait does not mean to delay, for true justice will never stay unless embedded in the local life. So hey, take a moment, slow down. All right, there we go. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks so much, Robbie. So I'm just going to stop my share. Here we go.